All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get, get our class underway now. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the good night's rest we've had and the privilege we have to be here again today. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy to us. We ask your blessings now upon our, our class time this morning. Father, help us to focus on uh, the thoughts that we have before us today. And, and uh, Father, as we think about your, your holiness, this very likely may be the most important class session we'll have this semester. And help us to uh, get the full benefit from our study today and put our attention upon, upon your wonder and your glory. Father, bless throughout the day in all of our classes, all of our activities, the services tonight at church. And Father, we look forward to that time. We pray your blessings upon all of our people. We pray that you'll keep your hand of protection upon us. And Father, help us to be a good testimony to others. Father, help us to be an encouragement to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Speaking of being an encouragement... <coughs> Uh, I want to remind you that uh, we are going to be doing test number one pretty quick. I want to go ahead and uh, uh, get into our lesson this morning, so we'll plan on doing our test review on Friday. So make sure you have all the notes from day one of this semester with you in class on Friday. I originally wanted to go ahead and do the test next Wednesday, but uh, I think we'll put it off until Friday of next week. Next Wednesday we've got... Uh, um, trying to remember Valentine's Day yeah so most of you will be in another galaxy that day we've got an activity the night before the uh, fellowship banquet situation so so I doubt you'll be focused too much on Bible doctors and notes that day so we'll go ahead and uh, figure on that a week from Friday we'll remind you that of course uh, as we get closer to it but we'll go ahead and do the test review this week on Friday and that way you'll pretty well be clued in on what you're going to need to know <clears throat> All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to Psalm chapter 145, Psalm 145. I'm going to continue our thoughts here concerning the holiness of God. And I think probably the last thing I had you write down in our last session was that statement that holiness is the quality or the attribute above all others by which God uh, wants to be known. That's the basic message throughout the scriptures, certainly throughout the Old Testament. And there are just so many, so many verses that speak to those thoughts. And, uh, and, and, of course, the fact that God is a holy God, as we saw in Joshua chapter 24. And um, here in Psalm 145, I want you to write this verse into your notes. It's, it's a little bit short, but it's really right on the money as to what we're talking about. Look at verse number 17, if you will. Psalm 145, verse 17, where the psalmist says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Go ahead and put that into your notes, if you will. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. <clears throat> the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. I think, uh, I think the Apostle John sums up the thought pretty well in the words found in, let me just give this to you and you can write it down, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. When you think about the holiness of God, think about it from this perspective where John says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. <laughs> Can't say that about anybody else, amen? God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That's 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Insert that into your notes as well. 1 John 1, 5. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God doesn't have a, a good side and a bad side. He's perfect, amen? And unlike people, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, there are really two aspects to God's holiness that I want to think about here in our introduction this morning. We've been talking about the first one for the last several class sessions. And, uh, and that aspect of God's holiness, of course, is just what we've been talking about, his absolute perfection, his absolute purity. And uh, on the other hand, the second aspect of God's holiness, and this will be new to you, so you want to probably put something in your notes about this, the two aspects of God's holiness First of all is his absolute perfection and purity. 
The second aspect of God's holiness is his complete separation from all that is evil. His complete separation from all that is evil. Just simply the emphasis upon the fact of God's absolute perfection and purity. His absolute perfection and purity. And then secondly is, is his complete separation from all that is evil. Now I realize they kind of go hand in hand. God is the holy God and his holiness is very clearly seen in his hatred of sin and the necessity of him being separated from it. Alright, let's put that in there as well. God is the holy God and his holiness is very clearly seen. God is the holy God and his holiness Holiness is very clearly seen in his hatred of sin and the necessity of being separated from it. And the necessity of being separated from it. God is the holy God and his holiness is very clearly seen in his hatred of sin and the necessity of being separated from it. Well, there's a verse in the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, that tells us that that very thing about God. Let me give it to you. I think we've looked at this before. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, uh, the portion of the verse that I want to focus on is this part. It says, "Thou, speaking of the Lord, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Write it down, Habakkuk 1, 13. Thou art of purer eyes. P-U-R-E-R, purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. That's this aspect of God's holiness that I'm talking about. His complete separation from all that is evil, all that is sinful. That's why if not for the finished work of redemption by our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we would be without hope and we would be doomed to spend eternity in hell. Because, write it down, because God is holy and will not permit sin in his presence, because God is holy and will not permit sin in his presence, because God is holy and will not permit sin in his presence, a mediator was needed to stand between God and a sinful people. Because God is holy and will not permit sin in his presence, a mediator was needed to stand between God and a sinful people. A mediator was needed to stand between God and a sinful people. Well, in the Old Testament, God put together the sacrificial system. The priest stood between the people and the Lord and filled that gap through the means of the sacrificial system that was established by the Lord. But then, according to Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. And, of course, Jesus became our mediator. Jesus became our substitute, the only mediator. You know the verse, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, underline, uh, write this statement down and underline it. Put stars beside it. This is so very, very important. Here it is. Our understanding of God's holiness, <clears throat> our understanding of God's holiness will determine our concept of God. Our understanding of God's holiness will determine our concept of God. Now, if you've not learned anything else in your class on fear of the Lord so far this semester, and I'm sure you've learned a lot more, but that's one thing that you really need to get nailed down right there. All of us do. Our understanding of God's holiness will determine our concept of God. Think about it like this. A holy and righteous God cannot be treated uh, like he's our pal, he's our buddy. <laughs> he's the man upstairs like the world sometimes refers to him. Uh, that kind of nonsense. It's true that his love draws us to him. It's true that as believers we can go boldly to the throne of grace for our needs, but at the same time uh, there should not be any presumption on our part. 
At the same time, His holiness should make us approach Him, shall I just simply say, with reverence and, and with awe, and yes, with fear. His majesty and greatness are certainly beyond our human comprehension. And so the failure to recognize God for who He really is, in my opinion, is, is one of the biggest problems, if not the real problem, in the world today and in our nation today. And uh, people do not respect God, and they certainly do not fear Him. We are living in a country, uh, the best I can say is we're living in a country that has become profane. And uh, we've turned our backs on God and everything that is decent and holy in our society. Yeah, they still call America a Christian nation, but like many people, it's Christian in name only. And uh, why is that? Because we have forgotten the holiness of God. Here's another reference for you. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11. Exodus 15, 11 tells us, and I'll quote it to you here in just a moment, but it tells us in so many words that God is glorious in His holiness. Glorious in holiness, I think is the exact term. Here's the way it goes. It says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Get the reference down to Exodus 15.11 and that little phrase, glorious in holiness. I don't know where this quote came from. I don't have the, the, uh, the name of the individual that came up with it, but this is pretty good. Write this down. Someone once said, that power is God's hand, <clears throat> power is God's hand, omniscience his eye, power is God's hand, omniscience his eye, mercy his bowels, mercy his bowels, eternity his duration, eternity his duration, but holiness is his beauty. But holiness is his beauty. Power is God's hand. Omniscience his eye. Mercy his bowels. Eternity his duration. But holiness is his beauty. Now I mentioned at the beginning of class this morning that holiness is the attribute above all others by which God wants to be known. That's the basic message in the scripture. Let's put this statement down. This will, I'm sure, be a test question. So again, get this statement, underline it, put neon lights around it, whatever you need to do. God's holiness is the crowning glory of all his attributes. God's holiness is the crowning glory of all his attributes. God's holiness is the crowning glory of all his attributes. And it is. Think about it. God's justice, for example, is a holy justice. You read in the paper, uh, there was a thing in the paper just the last day or two about a, a court, uh, ju a judge in a court here in Polk County turning a murderer loose for uh, obviously no reason other than the, in the fact that the judge thought that the decision might be overturned at the next level and she didn't want to have a bad mark on her record. And even the jurors are coming out and saying the guy's guilty of sin. She turned him loose and she's probably going to get uh, in trouble over it when it's all said and done. Um, man's justice is, uh, shall we say, debatable at times. God's justice is a holy justice. God's wisdom is a holy wisdom. His power is a holy power. His goodness is a holy goodness. His truth is a holy truth. And on and on we can go. God is glorious in His holiness. It is holiness by which He desires to be known because holiness is the attribute which glorifies Him most. Psalm 111, verse 9. Psalm 111, verse 9. <clears throat> Let me uh, give it to you here, and then we'll write down uh, a part of it in our notes. Psalm 111, verse 9 says, He sent redemption unto His people. He hath commanded His covenant forever. Get this part down into your notes. Holy and reverend is His name. Holy and reverend is His name. That's why most fundamental independent Baptist preachers don't like to be called reverend. Because that's God's name. Amen? The world doesn't understand that. 
and uh, and so sometimes you just have to kind of go with the flow. But but uh, most most preachers don't like to be called that because of this very thought right here. Holy and reverend is God's name. All right, Psalm 111, verse 9. Holy and reverend is His name. The holiness of God. How casual we often are about the things of God. And and let me just tell you something. When we are that way. It just shows how little we really understand, how really we really know of what God is like. Now open your Bibles, if you will, to the sixth chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. We're all familiar with this portion of Scripture. We've heard many, many sermons about it throughout the years, I'm sure, uh, about Isaiah's vision, Isaiah's call into the ministry. I, I doubt that we've hardly ever been part of a missions conference, but where someone came to this passage of scripture, especially verse 8, where, where it talks about when the Lord says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And uh, then said I, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And uh, this is a familiar portion of scripture. This sixth chapter is the story, as I said, of Isaiah's call into the ministry, call to be the, the prophet, to be the man of God. And Isaiah was submissive to God's call. We've talked about some others before. Unlike Moses, and unlike a few others we read about in the Scripture, uh, and unlike many people today, Isaiah didn't try to talk God out of it, did he? (laughs) No, he just simply obeyed the Lord. And uh, there's much that we can learn from the life of Isaiah. He was, uh, to say the least, he was revered, he was honored among the people. When Isaiah came upon the scene in terms of the, of the his, historical background of this account of Scripture, when Isaiah came upon the scene, Israel had just passed through a, uh, a continuing series of evil and ungodly rulers, but stuck in between uh, all those wicked kings was a godly king named Uzziah. And Uzziah feared the Lord, and he led Israel, uh, of course, into godly living. And he worshipped the Lord, and uh, King Uzziah reigned some uh, 50 years or thereabouts. And, and so this is the focus of the sixth chapter of Isaiah. As Isaiah comes to the temple this day to mourn King Uzziah's death. The primary focus of chapter 6 is not Uzziah, however. The primary focus is the holiness of God. In fact, throughout the entire book of Isaiah, uh, God is referred to as the Holy One Uh, numerous times. Now let's look at it together. Pick it up here with me in Isaiah chapter 6. It's not a very long chapter. Let's just look at it together and then we'll try to uh, do some thoughts with it here this morning in the time we have. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah writes and he says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it, above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the voice was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, 
and as an oak whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Now, as we think about this portion of Scripture this morning, we see that Isaiah uh, has a, a vision from the Lord. He sees the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. <clears throat> the Lord here, of course, is the Lord. Amen? Almighty God Himself. And Isaiah, mourn, as Isaiah mourns the death of King Uzziah, God reveals Himself to this prophet uh, as, as the Sovereign One. He's seated upon the throne, high and lifted up. That is speaking, of, of course, of God's sovereignty and authority over all the universe. Notice verse number 2 again, if you will. It says, uh, above it stood the seraphim. Seraphims are, are celestial beings, angelic beings who uh, attended the heavenly court. Their, <coughs> excuse me, their sole purpose, obviously, was to worship the Lord and to bring honor to God. Now take note again of verse number 3. And I want to focus on this thought here just for a little bit this morning. And one of the seraphims, and one cried unto another and said, notice now, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now take special notice of the importance attached to that statement. When God wants to call special attention to something, he does the same thing that we do. He uses repetition. Amen? And uh, now, I learned a long time ago as a teacher that repetition is the key to learning. It's the key to knowledge. And uh, so you guys just think I repeat myself a lot because I don't know any better, which is true. But actually, there's a plan. There's a method, all right? I'm trying to get something across, all right? Teachers use that same approach today. Moms and dads use that same approach today, amen, when they tell you time and time again to do something. So repetition is used to place special emphasis where it is needed. Need I remind you that Jesus, of course, was the master teacher of all time. And we find him frequently using statements in the New Testament that are commonplace to us, like, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. That's like saying, now hear this. This is important. Get this. Don't miss this, you know. And, uh, and so, as we know, every word of Scripture is important, but it's like it's saying here, you know, this is very important. This is super important. The seraphim sang the greatest hymn found anywhere in the Scripture uh, when they sang those words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And so, God is placing great emphasis on His holiness. The interesting thing to me is that only one attribute, this one, in all of Scripture, in all of Holy Scripture, is repeated three times. For example, the Bible tells us in uh, 1 John chapter 4, and verse 8, that God is love. But I don't read anywhere in the Scripture where it says God is love, love, love. Man, much is found in the Scriptures about the wisdom of God, but it does not say anywhere that I'm aware of that God is wise, 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 and so forth. You see my point. But God's Word does say here that God is holy, holy, holy. You'll find that same thought expressed in the New Testament as well in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. God is holy, holy, holy. Someone has suggested that that... Uh, statement is a reference to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, they're certainly all God, and of course they're all holy, amen? Yeah. Certainly the holiness of God is lifted to a place of primary importance. Now look again at verse number 4. <clears throat> After the seraphims uh, made these statements, it says in verse 4, And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, that's the Lord himself, and the house was filled with smoke. The house, the temple, is what it's talking about here. The house was shaken. Not just the door, but the scripture says that the post of the door, which were firmly fixed, moved at the sound of God's voice. And uh, that's very impressive when you stop and think about the fact that even the building, an inanimate object, moved. Compare that to this day and age, and the average church, and, and yeah, the average Christian, uh, who, who seemingly is not moved at all by the holiness of God. Isaiah was certainly moved, wasn't he? Yeah. Isaiah didn't do what we would probably have been tempted to do. He didn't run out of the temple <laughs> in fear, although he probably was tempted to do so. No, Isaiah did something very, very unusual here. 
And uh, the prophets, as you know, of course, were God's messengers to the people. And their messages usually went one of two ways, and sometimes both ways. Their messages were positive or negative. The positive ones were usually preceded by the word blessed. We see that time and, uh, and time again in the scripture. Again, in his earthly ministry, Christ often used that approach in his message to the people. As in, we see in the, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, that portion of scripture in chapter 5 that we refer to as the uh, Beatitudes. You find those kind of statements. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, and so forth. The negative messages from the prophets were pronouncements of coming judgment and condemnation, and they were usually preceded by the word woe, as we find it here in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Woe, W-O-E. And uh, we find Jesus using that same term as we learned uh, in an earlier lesson this semester in Matthew 23 in reference to the Pharisees. Jesus said, for example, in Matthew 23:15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and so on. Now, as I said, Isaiah did something very unusual. Uh, he pronounced a message of doom upon himself. Notice again what he said there in verse number 5. Then said I... Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord, uh, the Lord of hosts. And uh, Isaiah, I want you to write this down. During this experience, Isaiah made two amazing discoveries. Write this down. Isaiah made two amazing discoveries. First of all, number one, he saw who God was. He saw who God was. And I guarantee you he never got over that, amen? He saw who God was, and then secondly, and this is the practical application for all of us, shall I just say it like this? Number two, he saw who Isaiah was. <laughs> he saw who Isaiah was. He saw who God was, and he saw who Isaiah was. Let's reword that a little bit and say it like this for your notes. God, Isaiah got a glimpse of the holiness of God. Write it down. Isaiah got a glimpse of the holiness of God. Isaiah got a glimpse of the holiness of God. And when he saw the glory of God, and when he saw the glory of God, He got a glimpse of the holiness of God, and when he saw the glory of God, he realized how unworthy and how sinful he was. He realized how unworthy and how sinful he was to be in the presence of the Lord. Isaiah got a glimpse of the holiness of God, and when he saw the glory of God, he realized how unworthy and how sinful he was to be in the presence of the Lord. Now think about that for a minute. You have to kind of figure that compared to most folks, Isaiah had to measure up pretty well. <laughs> I mean, man called of God, a prophet, uh, a man of God, a spiritual leader of the people, pretty solid credentials, I'd say. Isaiah, here's the point, Isaiah measured up pretty well, perhaps with the rest of the crowd in Israel, <coughs> But this day, here, here's what I want you to get down. He began to see himself, Isaiah began to see himself, not in comparison to other people. Isaiah began to see himself not in comparison to other people, but against the absolute standard of God's holiness. Isaiah began to see himself not in comparison to other people, but against the absolute standard of God's holiness. Isaiah began to see himself not in comparison to other people, but against the absolute standard of God's holiness. Now let's park right there for a minute and think about that. Because that's where we live our lives, right there. How often we are guilty 
of measuring ourselves in comparison to others. Uh, let me just illustrate this in a very practical way that I think we can all understand. Most of us uh, are involved and have been involved in the bus ministry. Uh, at Landmark, of course, you know that we keep very accurate records, as most churches do, of our attendance figures and all that kind of stuff. We have a bus board on the back wall of the church auditorium, and, and, uh, and, and of course, all the bus routes are listed and the number of riders that came on that bus that come on that bus each week are are posted uh, every Sunday and uh, until the next Sunday we even put the name of the bus captain and so forth up there as well we put the same information in the church bulletin that our folks receive on Sunday mornings now there are several reasons for doing that we want the average church member to be informed about what's happening in the bus ministry we want them to rejoice in the Lord's blessings we want them to pray for the needs of the bus ministry. We want God to touch their hearts concerning the burden that we have for lost souls. We want them, of course, to uh, give sacrificially to finance the operation of the bus ministry. Uh, we run 12 bus routes every Sunday. And uh, that, as most of you are involved in that. You know it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of dedication. It takes a lot of money, too. Tried buying a tank full of gas lately. Uh, go fill up one of those buses that holds about 60 gallons. And, uh, and it just seems like the cost just, you know, gets ridiculous all the time. Our people, praise the Lord, are responsive to those needs. They have a burden for the bus ministry. And uh, one of the reasons is because we keep it before them. And Pastor Carter emphasizes uh, those thoughts from the pulpit. And, uh, and, and Pastor Carter's always there, of course, if he's not out of town or ill on Saturday morning, and he's at the bus meeting and the bus breakfast and so forth, and he's the one that started it. He started the first two bus routes that we had at our church many years ago, and even drove one of them for a good while. And, uh, and so uh, one of the men of our church recently, well, not so recently, over the last few years, uh, just really kind of revolutionized our, our fleet of buses. And uh, you say, well, I've seen your buses. They're not all that swift. Well, you should have seen the ones that we had before this bunch. Amen. <laughs> and so praise the Lord. One of our men uh, has probably purchased, uh, I would suppose, six or eight of those buses for us. And the Lord just touched his heart. And, and he came to me and he said, uh, you know, look for some buses and, and, uh, and let me know the cost. And, and the Lord's blessed and we'll take care of it. And so we did. Amen. And we were able to uh, replace some of our uh, other stuff that we put out to pasture. Well, uh, there's another aspect to the bus board in the back of the church, and, and here it is. <laughs> I wouldn't want my name up there if I was a sorry, lazy, good-for-nothing bus captain that wasn't doing the job. It's a little bit of a psychological message there. Now, the truth of the matter is I had my name up there for many, many years as a bus captain, and, uh, you know, I think probably the, the worst Sunday I ever had on my bus route, I don't, I don't remember all the circumstances, mainly because I don't want to remember them, amen. But uh, boy, I, had, I had, I think, 13 on my bus one time, and uh, that was the lowest that we ever hit. I didn't even want to bring the bus back to church that day, you know. And that was all, the all-time low. In all my years in the bus ministry, I was ashamed to have that number up there on the bus board on Sunday morning and again on Sunday night. And oh my soul, there it was again on Wednesday night, right? And so that week I got motivated. And uh, I visited like I was going for a new record. I visited on Tuesday night. I visited on Friday night. I visited all day Saturday. I did not want to be associated with an unsuccessful bus route. That really motivated me. Well, right motive or wrong motive, I'll have to admit, it motivated me. I can also remember, because in this case I like to remember, <laughs> many, many Sundays where, where we were the top bus route that week, you know. And I would think to myself, you know, that's why they call us bus number one, because we're the best. Amen? And uh, I didn't mind having my name up there on days like that. In fact, I tell folks in the church, you see bus number one up there, you know. So, <laughs> Well... <clears throat> Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. One day in my, during my devotions, I read a verse in this portion of Scripture that was just so real, the words just kind of jumped off the page and got a hold of me. It's a verse I'm sure I'd probably read many, many times before, but 
the times before it was just words on a page to me, even though it was God's word. Look, if you will, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 12. I really doubt that the Apostle Paul was thinking about the bus ministry when the Holy Spirit of God inspired him to write these words. But the Lord gives us a very, very important principle in this verse, and it comes back to our discussion of God's holiness. Look at verse number 12, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. For we dare not to make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Now that's quite a statement. And the Lord began to impress upon my heart how foolish that thought that I just described to you had been uh, regarding the bus routes and the bus board and all that nonsense and the pride factor that had come into all that. You see, I had no business comparing myself uh, or my success or even my failures in the bus ministry to other people. <laughs> Why is that? Because there are other people, Amen people that are subject to the same problems that I am. That's not the measuring stick that we are to use. I began to understand that it mattered very little what other people did or didn't do. I realized that they were not the standard for me, nor was I the standard for them. I had a big change of heart about that business, and I start, stopped looking at the numbers on the bus board in such a self-serving manner. I stopped thinking, well, did I have the top bus this week? I stopped thinking, well, I might not have had the top bus, but I didn't have the bottom one either, amen? <laughs> I know how bus workers think, amen? Some of them actually do think, but anyway. Um, <laughs> instead, I focused on whether or not, here it is, get this. I began, I began to focus on whether or not I had done my best before the Lord, not before other people. I did not want to continue practicing something that God had told me in his word was not wise. And I would advise you to do the same. How about your personal application to your studies? Now, we're still kind of early on in the semester, but I can still remember last semester, amen? You say, well, you know, I made a good grade on that last test. Well, good. The question is, did you do your best, you know? Well, I did better than most of my classmates. Well, look around the room. Some of your classmates are borderline retarded. Hello. All right. <laughs> Some of them are over the border, all right. But <laughs> no, that's not the point. The point is, did we do our best? I learned a very valuable lesson, and maybe my experience will help you in some degree to learn that lesson as well. Because there are just so many areas of our life where we can apply that truth. Now, we're going to wind down here in the last five minutes of class, but let me have your attention. Don't get this. Don't miss this. Isaiah learned the most important thing he would ever learn that particular day in the temple as he got a glimpse of the holiness of God. Now, as I said before, you've got to just figure Isaiah measured up pretty good, pretty well in comparison with other people, but his life didn't stack up very well against the absolute standard of God's holiness. Isaiah realized that other people were absent from the picture that day. It was just him and the Lord. And when Isaiah saw himself in comparison to the absolute standard of God's holiness. Again, look at what he said in verse number 5. He said, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, for I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah was confronted with the realization of how unworthy he was to be in God's presence. How did he know that? Last part of the verse. For mine eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. And so from that day forth, Isaiah would never be the same person. Think about the many, many times in his ministry for the Lord that, uh, that people gave him a hard time and people tried to discourage him. You know, hey, Brother Isaiah, it's okay to have religion and all that stuff, but you don't have to go crazy over it, you know. There's other things in life besides reading the Bible and praying all the time and preaching all the time. You don't have to be such a fanatic. Isaiah could just think back to this momentous day in the temple when his life was changed and he could never be the same again. And he would remember and he would think, I can't help myself. Mine eyes have seen the king. And once you've seen the king, the Lord in his glory, in his, in his glory and in his holiness, you can never be the same again. That is what a vision of God's holiness does 
to his people. All right, I'm going to stop it right there. I've got just a little bit more to add to that, and then we're going to move into the next attribute in our class on Friday after the test review. So we'll do it then. Thank you. You're dismissed. Yeah.